So I want you to understand before, you know, we even did this idol sermon series, we knew and Josh knew and CJ knew and all the band knew, we knew that it wasn't going to be the most popular sermons when you start talking about food and you start talking about stuff and you start talking about things that, that maybe control our life. We knew that. And, and if, if you did happen to go back and watch the original uh, Willy Wonka, I want to tell you it was made in 1970. And when I first watched it, one of the things that used to be my favorite movie growing up, and I couldn't wait to get up here and do my sermon because that was my favorite movie. I would watch it every single time it came on. I watched the entire two hours. I never skipped out. I never fast forwarded. And when I was a little kid, we didn't even have fast forward. And I would watch the entire movie every time it would come on. And even when I got married and it would come on, Linda would be like, oh, no, Willy Wonka's on. <laughs> like, are you kidding me? Like, aren't you grown up? And I'm like, I love this show. It's so good. I mean, it's great. How can you not love the Oompa Loompas? I mean, they're awesome. And, I mean, how could you not like that? How could you not like the candy room? And, and how could you not like this factory of imagination? I mean, it just really rang with me, and I loved it. But one person that I did not like in that movie was that Veruca. And Veruca, man, I mean, it starts out on the scene with her. I mean, in the very beginning, if you even meet her, she's sitting in the office of her father's plant uh, that her father owns, right? So you know he's jack-loaded. Anything this kid ever wanted, she, you know, she could have. And she's sitting there on the couch in her father's plant, who that her father owns, and she's saying, I want a golden ticket. And he's like, I'm doing everything I can do, Veruca. And she's like, you need to do more, and you don't love me. And he's like, I'm doing the best. And she's like, they're not working hard enough out there, and, and I want a golden ticket. And he runs to the window, and he opens the window. And you guys remember this scene? And he says, whoever finds a golden ticket, there's going to be a bonus on your check. And, and all of a sudden, they start working harder, and they're doing 19,000 boxes. An hour, opening these candy bars, trying to find the golden ticket, and, and, and they haven't found it yet. And he comes over, and he's like, I'm doing everything, Veruca, I can do to please you. And she's like, you're not doing enough. And he's looking for her for direction. <laughs> and I'm like, I, as a little kid growing up in a completely different atmosphere, I want to tell you I never, ever sat on a couch in my parents' house and said, I am going to get this. My mom, my dad probably would have sat there and been like, eh, chill out, kid. But my mom would have jacked my jaw. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. Like, I remember going to houses when I was a kid, knowing already before I even went to the house, I was getting a whooping when I got home. I already knew it. It didn't matter. We would go to somebody's house, and, I, and my mom would be like, I'm going to play cards tonight, because that's what we did. Man, our family, when we was young, my family would go play cards somewhere, and they would all get drunk and drink, and, and all the kids would have to go upstairs on the second floor and be quiet in this house that was made of glass, I think. And I can remember, and my mom would pre-warn me every single time. She'd be like, I just want to give you a pre-warning. Here's how it's going to roll. When we get home, if you all don't fall in line, you're getting a beating. It wasn't a whooping. We all got a beating. And, I, and every time, I would just count on it before we go, and I'd be like, all right, I'm getting whooped when I get home. So I would just go have fun, right? I would go up and jump on these kids' beds, and we'd be making, I mean, just the craziest noises upstairs. And, and my mom, she would just chill out and play cards the whole night, drink and have fun. And as soon as we walk out the door, she's like, you know what this means, right? And I'm like, oh, I know, I'm good. <laughs> I'm, I'll just accept it. For one, you don't swing that hard, you know? <laughs> I can take the beating. It's okay. But I can remember, though, face to face with my mom, you didn't mess with my mom. And you just ain't how it rolled. My mom ran the show. If my dad ever got mad, you knew just get out of the area, just run. Because my dad never got mad like maybe one time in all my life. And the one time he got mad, I remember him ripping the foam off the wall of our house. And I know a lot of you little kids in here don't remember. But they, there was this thing that called phones that were connected to the walls. Like... Uh, right, and all you little kids now, I got these, I, I collected two iPhones just playing around back there from two little boys, and I was, give me your phones, and they gave me their phones, I put them in my pocket, but that wasn't how I grew up. If, if I wanted to talk to a girl when I was young, I had to run with this phone, like, like 19 foot, we'd have an extension cord, it was like an extension cord, it would go from here to the back wall, so I could go wherever I wanted to on the first floor of our house. We didn't have what these kids have today. These kids get everything that they want today, Amen. Amen? Amen? But when we were a little kid, I didn't have all that stuff. So I couldn't even relate to, like, Veruca. 
I'm looking at her when I was a kid, and I'm thinking, okay, this is just complete imagination, right? I'm looking at her, and I'm thinking, like, whose father would really do that? Whose mother would really do that? And, and it just cracked me up because when they found the golden ticket, when they found the golden ticket, check this statement out that the mom makes. Listen to this. Happiness is what counts for children. Happiness and harmony. And I can remember even as a little kid thinking, well, Veruca needs a beating. Veruca needs to come live at our house a little bit. Veruca's got a problem, you know, and she doesn't understand it, that Veruca's a little brat. Amen? So it doesn't even get any better when she leaves the plant. When she gets to the Willy Wonka's front gates, you know what her first statement was? Is, I want to go in first. It wasn't good enough that she got the golden ticket and that she got to go in. Now Veruca wanted to go in first. And then when she got into the plant, guess what she demanded? She demanded that she get an Oompa Loompa. Like you could take a real, like if Oompa Loompas were real, right? That you could actually just take one home and they're just going to be your little toy. That Oompa Loompas, I mean, I wanted an Oompa Loompa too, but I wasn't going to demand an Oompa Loompa when I was a kid. It wasn't even the realm. It was just imagination, right? And then do you remember when, when, the, when uh, Willie was, the, 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 what was his name, Willy Wonka? Yeah, Willy Wonka, y'all with me? Yeah. Everybody with me today? Yeah. All right, you're getting too quiet. You got to either laugh, say amen, or do something. Amen? Amen. 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 Now you're with me. See, I know. Well, when he was passing out the everlasting God stoppers, he kind of made a promise. You remember this? He said, you got to promise that you never give this away, that you never give it to anyone. And so Veruca is the one saying, and he's like, do you promise? And she raises her hand, she promises, and behind her back, she's got her fingers crossed as an escape goat. And I'm thinking, you little brat. Like, kids do that all the time. I remember my mom would be like, you promise you're going to be good when you go into this house and I play cards. And I'm like, oh, mom, I'm good. And I knew, like, I'm like, I'm not going to be good. You might as well give me a whooping before we go in or whooping when we get home. All right? But when she got into the egg room, Veruca does a little song and it went like this. Show it, guys. Hey, Daddy, I want a golden goose. Here we go again. All right, sweetheart. All right. Daddy will get you a golden goose as soon as we get home. No, I want one of those. Wonka. How much do you want for the golden goose? They're not for sale. Name your price. She can't have one. Who says I can't? The man with a funny hat. I want one. I want a golden goose. Gooses. Geeses. I want my geese to lay gold eggs for Easter. It will, sweetheart. At least a hundred a day. Anything you say. And by the way, what? I want a feast. You egg before you came to the factory. I want a bean feast. One of those. Cream buns and donuts and fruitcake with no nuts. So good you could go nuts. You're going to have all those things when you get home. No, now. I want a ball. I want a party. Pink macaroons and a million balloons and performing baboons and give it to me. <laughs> now. I want the world. I want the whole world. I want to lock it all up in my pocket. It's my bar of chocolate. Give it to me now. I want today. I want tomorrow. I want to wear them like braids in my hair, and I don't want to share them. I want a party with roomfuls of laughter, 10,000 tons of ice cream. And if I don't get the things I am after, I'm going to scream! I want the works, I want the whole works, presents and prizes and sweets and surprises of all shapes and sizes, and now, don't care how I want it now. Don't care how I want it now. She was a bad egg. Oh. Where's she gone? Where all the other bad eggs go? Down the garbage chute. Oh, the garbage chute. <laughs> where, where did it lead to? To the furnace. <laughs> the furnace! <laughs> She'd be sitting like a sausage. Well, not necessarily. She could be stuck just inside the tube. Inside the... Hold on! Veruca! Sweetheart! Daddy's coming! And so, I started to really think about this show a little bit, folks. And do you know 
that this show was made up of imagination. That they were showing the extremes of what a child would do. The extremes of a child demanding something. And when I look at the world today, I see a lot of Barucas. <laughs> I think maybe I saw a Baruka down at the Walmart a couple times. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Wanting something. You know, kids just going through Walmart in, in, in the baskets and screaming. I'm pretty sure I saw a Baruka last night at that church I was at. I'm pretty sure. I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure. And sometimes I've even seen the Baruka running around this place. Amen? Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Listen, why? Because kids, while, while left unattended or, or disciplined or, or guided, they will come up with their own rules. Of wanting it now. Whatever I want, I'm going to do. Whatever I want, I'm going to do. And there ain't nothing you can do about it. But I want to tell you that in 1970, when this movie was created, it was imagination which has become reality in our world today. Why? Because we just keep giving and we keep giving and we keep giving and we keep giving stuff and we keep giving this and we keep giving that and we think that that's going to buy the love. We think that that's going to buy the happiness. We think that if we just give in here and we give in there and we just can give them this and give them that and we give them an iPhone and a $400 pair of shoes and the nice you know, $150 pair of jeans and we make sure they got that nice car to drive, that that's going to bring the joy and that's going to bring the happiness. When the truth is, is they don't have a material problem, and we as adults, listen, that ain't just kids. That's adults today. We have adults, and we have children, we have a society that doesn't have a material problem. They have a God problem. Because what we're really trying to do is we're trying to take material, and we're trying to replace it with what God is. We're trying to replace the material when I'm going to buy this and I'm going to buy that. And I have a very, very, very close friend that, that for years I called him my best friend. And this, this, this friend of mine makes a lot, a lot of money. And, 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 and not only does he make a lot of money, he buys his children every single thing. He has the Baruka living in his house as his daughter. And I remember one day we was on vacation with them, and, and uh, we were too poor to even go on that vacation. And they're like, you're going on vacation with us. And I'm like, no, we're not. They're like, we're buying everything. I said, yes, we are. <laughs> it's easy. You want me to go on vacation with you? It's real easy. Just pay for me to go. And he said, yeah, you're going. And, and I said, okay. He said, all right, I'm paying for it. I said, okay, you're paying for it. We're going. Amen. We're all going then. And we go on vacation. And I remember his daughter making a statement down there that cracked me up. She says, if you don't buy me this certain color car and this exact car and a brand new car, I ain't driving nothing. I'm laughing like, well, you ain't driving nothing then. And he's like, I'm going to do the best I can, Baruka. And he, no, I'm just kidding. He didn't call her Baruka. He said, I'm going to get. And you know what, guys? When she turned 16, when they had her party exactly the place she wanted, guess what pulled up outside is that brand new car, that color, everything she wanted. And I said, man, you are so not doing her a good service. But we as adults, we do that to our children. We as adults, we do that for ourselves. We want the big houses. We want it bigger, and we want it newer. We want it smarter. We want it faster. We want it cooler. We want all the upgraded gadgets that we can get. And for a moment, it does buy happiness. Why do I know that? Because I've had those gadgets, and they make me happy for a minute. But they don't bring me long-term joy. They don't bring me long-term joy. I feel empty. After about a month of having something brand new, it's already old. I've told you stories, and my kids would come home, and they'd be like, I remember the first time my son came home with an iPhone. He's like, Dad, you've got this one of them little Android flip phones. And check out my iPhone 4. And I'm like, dude, that's pretty cool, but I don't need that. He's like, dude, it's the best thing ever. And all of a sudden, I finally get an iPhone 4, and he's moving up to like an iPhone 5, and my iPhone's not good enough anymore. And I'm like, dude, but, I, but the iPhone 4 was it. And he's like, but it ain't it no more. And all of a sudden, I get an iPhone 5, and now they got 6s and they got 7s. And all of a sudden, my iPhone 5 that I got now, it ain't the hippest and it ain't the coolest. Because I don't have the newest thing out. If you don't drive a brand new truck, some people think, well, if I don't have a newer car, I, if I don't have the nicer house, I'm not going to be happy. I promise you, material stuff will never make you happy. And you don't have a material problem. You have a God problem. 
And I know that's not popular, but I want to show you something in the Bible that if we really truly say, see, we get made fun of as a church, folks. If you attend Revive, you're being made fun of today. Why? Because they see we do stuff like this, and you got gold and like a goose sitting up there that's really a float that goes in a pool, and you paint gold and eggs on a wall. And why would you do all this work? And they laugh at us. And, and But here's the truth, is that we feel like as a church, we bring the word, and we tell people the truth. But you can only, listen, if you don't do what we say with the word, and if you don't study it yourself, you're going to have an issue yourself. But we bring the word. And I want to show you a verse today that has really become one of my life verses. And it's Matthew 6, 33. Listen to this. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Can I tell you what the added to you is real quick? The added to you is that God knows everything you need. And that's exactly what that verse means. God knows what you need and God knows what you don't need. And God will add to it as he needs to add to it. And you don't have to sweat it. But your job as a Christian, as a Bible reader, and to call yourself a Christian, as a Christ follower, as a disciple, for you to say that you're saved, your job and your only job, the Bible says, is to seek first the kingdom of God. Now, I went to lunch with my friend this week. Right? He's probably my best friend that I actually have. Right? And I confide in him. He confides in me. And, and we tell each other about every single thing. It's funny. And, and I was telling him what I was going to preach on this week. And he said, man, when you get to that point right there, he said, you just need to do a drop mic on him and walk out of the building. I said, I tried that once. That don't work. I had all the pastors and worship team like, what is he doing when he just walks out? Y'all remember that? At the high school when I just walked out one day? Just like, you know, making a statement like, what would you do with this? And this walked out. And I said, I don't really want to do a drop mic on it. Why? Because people don't get this verse. People don't always live. By, I don't always live by this verse. Josh was talking about the whole uh, gluttony thing and everything. Isn't it funny that I didn't get stick with the gluttony thing? Isn't that funny? <laughs> I'm saying, I said, I ain't doing that one, man. They wanted to pay, put my picture on the tube and everything. I said, don't you put my face on that tube. I'm telling you right now. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you right now, Pastor Josh needed to do that sermon because that mug eats twice as much as I do, and I don't know how he don't gain a bit of weight, right? Only thing I can figure is because he's like eight foot tall, you know, I think if he was my height, he'd weigh 500 pounds. I'm almost sure of it. I'm almost positive. But I wanted to get the material sermon, just like, just like uh, CJ wanted the sermon that he got, you know, on Grandpa. I wanted this sermon because I'm faced with it all the time and our church and our society is always faced with the newer, better gadgets and the, and the things that we have to have to make us happy. You know, these things that we have to give our kids and these things that we want in our own life and the Bible says, seek first. So I want to break this down for one second. I just want you to leave that verse up here, but I want you to just check out these words and it says, but seek. Just two words right there, but seek. See, we've lost our passion, folks, to seek the word of God. We've lost our passion to seek the kingdom of God. We've lost the passion to seek the things of God. And we as a church and we as a body and we as believers, trust me, you want this word. You want to hear the word. Just like it is, man, like all raw. You want to walk out of here and feel like, dude, I just heard some word. I didn't like exactly what I heard because, you know, maybe I do focus on material stuff. But they just preached the word straight to my face. And they told me what I need to be seeking. Why? It's so important. And I'm going to show you in just a second. But the Bible says that you need to seek. And do you know why we can't seek the kingdom of God anymore? Because we're too busy seeking the things of the world. We're too busy. We don't have time for God. We don't have time to say, God, I'm going to put you more in my life, that I'm going to be in small groups more, that I'm going to be serving the church more, I'm going to be used by God more. We simply don't have time to seek the kingdom of God anymore. I want you to do a real, just a personal assessment in your mind real quick. And I want you to just a real quick, and I don't want anybody to say anything, but just really quick. You already know your schedules for this week coming up. Some of you have got sports to attend. 
Some of you have got multiple sports to attend. Some of you have got jobs to work 60 and 70 hours. That we say, I work 60 and 70 hours to put food on the table for my family. But no, you're working 60, 70 hours a week to pay for that house that you're living in out of your means and to drive them trucks and cars that you drive. That's why you're working 60, 70 hours a week because you're done living out of your means to be in the kingdom of God, to serve the kingdom of God. And I know it ain't popular to say it, but it's true, folks. We got people financing dreams that they can't even afford right now to pay for later, so it requires the husband and the wife to be working some mass hours. And they don't stop there, folks. We get done with that, and we're running to sports, and we're running to this, and we're running to that, and all the things that we want to do and the high-priority stuff in our life that we don't have time to seek God. But, but listen, I want to tell you, if your lifestyle is contradicting the Bible, what God says, seek first, then you're not living the right lifestyle. And that is the word of God, not Earl Breeden. You can't take it personal when it's coming from the Bible. You, can, you should take it personal when it's coming from the Bible, but you shouldn't be offended at me. You should be offended at God. And if you get offended by this message, it's not really, you know, you're not getting offended that I preach this message. You're getting offended that God said it and he's going to hold you accountable to it. Seek first the kingdom of God. Don't seek first your children's sports. Seek first the kingdom of God, not those 60, 70 hour week jobs you work. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you. But it's true. It starts out and it says first the thing you need to do is you got to seek. You got to seek. Second, the third word there says first. <laughs> first. Man, that's hard right there, ain't it? For all of us, it's hard. Man, I read something like that and I'm like, God, even as a pastor, I look at my own life and here, man, I spend all my time and I'm running here and I'm running there. And sometimes I feel like that even my priorities as a pastor, like, like I told Linda the other day, I said, I'm going to start saying no. No, I can't do that. No, I can't do that. And I said, I'm going to only do the things that really matter. I'm going to do the things that only I'm really passionate that God's called me to. I'm not going to agree to go do things that I don't want to do. Because see, even though things could be good things, they might not be godly things. You can make yourself available to every single person and really be of no use to no one once you get burned out, folks. That's all you got to do is just make yourself available to everyone and everything and you'll get burned out. I got a sister right now that me and her had a conversation. She's in the hospital right, well, she actually, she got out of the hospital, but she's sitting at home. She attends this church. She's got lupus. She's got diabetes. She told me on the phone the other day when I'm ironing my shirt yesterday, and I had just told her the day before, I said, sis, I said, I'm going to start saying no to things that really are, are not number one. And I'm ironing my shirt, getting ready to go over with the band over to Indiana. And she calls me up and she says, Earl, she said, I got lupus. And I really don't feel like I'm going to live much longer. And that's what God's telling me. And you know what I told my sister? I said, sis, all those years you've poured out and you've poured out and you've poured out and you've poured out. And my sister has given every single thing that she can give until she gets to the point where she's so sick and literally physically sick and health-wise sick, mentally sick and tired. She stood in this church last week crying, just crying and saying, I'm just tired, tired of being sick because she's gave so much. And at certain points, once you give too much to things that aren't of God, I promise you it's going to take a toll on your body. It's going to take a toll. So I want you to think for a second. This Bible right here, just this one verse, if this does verse does not shake you up, if this one verse right here, this one line doesn't make you live a different lifestyle, I want to challenge you and say that you really don't truly know God and you really truly aren't going to heaven. That's a big, bold statement, ain't it? I'm going to back it up in about two seconds. Give me a second, I promise you. But seek first. What is first in your life right now? I had to say this to myself. This is a personal attack to me, just like Josh told you that. CJ told you that. I'm telling you that. As a whole, what do we, what do I seek first? Nothing else is above the kingdom of God. Doesn't matter what it is. We can come up with names for it and we can even label it as Christianity because we did something that was Christian. 
Well, I went here and I, and I prayed for someone, so that must be a Christian thing. I can spend all my time and all my avenues, and that must be all of God. That's a bunch of bull. Seek first the kingdom of God. This, uh, this girl I know went on a mission trip. She was over in a foreign country, and I can't remember the foreign country right now she was in last year. And this pastor walks up to her and says, Oh, it's awesome that you're in, you're in you know, you live in the United States. It's awesome that you live in the United States. And, and, and you know, it's, how many people have you led to the Lord? And this girl says, Well, my family travels all over the United States, and we've led hundreds of people to the Lord. He's like, that is awesome. And he went to this next girl that was on the mission trip with her and says, awesome, you're going to a Christian school and you live in the United States and you're over here doing work and mission work for the Lord. How many people have you led to the Lord? And she says, well, my dad's a pastor and I have led no one to the Lord. And the pastor stopped and started crying. And he just looked at her and he says, I don't get that. In a country where it's free, to tell people about Jesus. How could you not spend your whole life turning people over to God in a place that it's free to pray openly? You can walk up right now to people in Walmart and say, is there anything I can pray for you for? And you can share your testimony of what God's done in your life about seeking first the kingdom of God. And I want to ask you a question today. How many people have you led to Christ? Because you know this Jesus. And that might tell you if you're truly seeking first the kingdom of God. Boy, that makes us all get quiet, don't it? That even makes us pastors get quiet. Because in the church, it's easy. When we go out there, it's not as easy for us either. It's hard. It's hard. Seek first the kingdom of God. Folks, I want to say this one more time. You, I am not attacking you today. You need this word. Why? Because this statement right here, seek first the kingdom of God and all its righteousness and these things will be added to you. Because it's a warning. It's not just a statement. It's not just a statement. It is a warning that will declare whether you know him or whether you don't know him. It's a, it's a warning that should be put up in front of the church. It says this is the mark to know if you really know him, if you're really going to heaven. It's a mark that says if you're not seeking first the kingdom of God, you are in jeopardy of going to hell. I know, right? We don't hardly say that in church anymore. We don't even say that in church anymore. Why? Because we don't want to give people the real reality that if you don't make it to heaven, you're not going to heaven, you're going to hell. Where your body's going to burn. Where you're going to be in complete darkness and complete torment. We don't say that anymore. We don't talk about this son that came from heaven. God's son, the father's son, that died on a cross and he died a horrible death. That if you look at that death, I mean just one time, I was just doing a little play. Just a little play where I had some of the buddies at church that was in leadership. And I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to carry a cross in and you're going to act like, act like, just act like. You're beating him on the way up. And we're going to crucify Jesus right in the front of the cross. Or right, or right on the cross in front of people. And it was kind of like a little play thing. You knew it was play. Everybody knew it was play. Everybody knew it wasn't real. We weren't really beating the guy that was carrying the cross. Even though I said, you need to scream a couple times to make it look like it. But as soon as I left that church, we only had about 75, 80 people there. I got five phone calls from people, including my own dad. They said, that was too much, son. That was too much, son. That was too much to show people, son. That was too much for the kids sitting in there, son. I said, well, the kids need to see that somebody died for them. Because if you don't win them, listen, if you don't win these teenagers, if we don't win these 60 youth that are coming to our youth group, if we don't win them to Christ now, there's a large percentage that will never win them to Christ. If we don't win these kids to Jesus now, so if it's too much for the adults, oh, that's just too much. You're just stretching my imagination. But it's okay to go watch these shows where people are chopping off somebody's heads in the movie theaters. That's not too much for you and your family. 
to go watch. Oh, it's too much if you bring the cross in and do a little play, but I can watch this gory stuff on my television and record every single one of them. That's not too much for my whole family to sit and watch. See, we don't want to see the realities of what the cross meant. The cross is offensive. You know why it's offensive? It's offensive because it calls out and says, you'll follow him or you won't follow him. You'll seek first the kingdom of God or you won't seek first the kingdom of God. If you think that verse was chilling, seek first the kingdom of God, check out my next verse. Matthew 7, 21, 23. Just listen to this. This is some of you sitting in here. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Wow, that's a big one. Uh, did we not cast out demons in your name? Did we not do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare them, I never knew you depart from me you workers of lawlessness <laughs> what folks listen this verse right here just so you know it was never intended for the people that were unsaved this verse right here was intended for the church because there are people that will be attenders of church and not really be seeking first the kingdom of god there would be churches that would flood to just hear a band or somebody that can speak eloquently. There would be people that would be following man because of what he can do and not the true God who died for them. There would be people that would come into churches all over the world that would say, we love the community, we love to come in here, but we really never ever open our Bibles up ever and read the Word of God. There would be people that would call themselves Christians that would say, we've never fasted a day in our life when the Bible says, I'm going to tell you right now, the Bible says that when you pray and when you give and when you fast, not if you fast, but when you fast. Jesus says when the bridegroom baby is taken away, when the bridegroom is taken away, then my disciples will. They, not that they shall or they might, they will fast. It's important that you hear this. Because when the Bible gives us a warning, the church needs to hear that warning. You might not like the warning. I might not like the warning. But if we're not doing self-accountability on our life, to say this is how it's going to be, then I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God. I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God. I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God. Why? So that I don't fall in this category. Folks, listen to me. I'm telling you. I'm giving you a warning like a warning label. I'm going to tell you, I got some habits, folks. You all know in here I ain't perfect. Every one of you in here, I've said it before, and I don't really care. I'll say it again. I dip as a pastor, and a lot of people are like, what? That's true. I do. I don't, I'm not going to hide it. Ain't no sense in me hiding it and getting in your car one day to go somewhere, and I'm dipping. I ain't no sense in even playing games. I dip. I don't like it. I dip. It's a habit. I don't want to do it. And one of these days, I'm going to quit it. But you know what's funny? The other day, I'm going down the road, right? And I'm just checking out my can of dip that I'm looking at. And it says Longhorn Pouches. And CJ and them call that the sissy dip. And I don't care. I like the pouches. I do. I, do. I ain't going to lie. I like them. But I'm dipping, right? And I'm looking at the warning labels on this can that I'm holding. And, like, it started out where the, 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 the tobacco companies, like, they would never want to put warning labels on their tobacco. And then they say, then they started putting the warning labels on the tobacco, and they said, this product may, may cause cancer. It may cause your lip to fall off and you not be able to talk anymore. It may, you know, I mean, just stuff like that. They, it may do it. We're not sure, but it may. Well, the other day I'm riding down the road, right, and I'm reading this can, and it says, it will. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, hold up now. That's a, oh, what? I'm looking at this, and it's like, it will. No, I'm sorry, I, Lord, forgive me. It didn't say will, it said it can. But can and may are completely different. It may do it, may mean that it might not. That's what my theory was. But it can 
is like, if you use this, you need to realize that you're probably going to get some lip cancer from this. And I'm reading that, and God is saying, and you're ignoring that, right? And I'm like, yep. <laughs> and he's like, yep. He said, but you know what? He said, bigger than that can that you're holding in your hand. He said, you know how many people word my, read my word of God that is the very source of life and are not taking my warning serious? It's different when you look at a can that has nothing to do with the word of God. It's different when you look at warning labels. You ever, you ever watch TV where they give you like all the warnings at the end? Like, you ever heard that? I can't even repeat it because it's so funny. But every time I'm watching, like, you need to try, like, this trypozoid medicine. It's going to be great. It's going to bring you healthy. And, by, and at the end of the commercial, they throw in one of these little deals like, this uh, medicine could make you die. Four out of five people have had uh, rectal blood coming out of them. Uh, if you have any problems with your heart, if you feel like you can't breathe, you might want to get to a hospital really quick. I mean, and this goes on and on and on. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> Like, if you ever listen to the warning labels at the back of the side of these medicines that, that, that they say on these commercials, I mean, that's a, um, for me, I'm not sure I want to try it just so that, you know, like, you know, I can get this one thing taken care of. That it's going to cause me 20 others of, of my ulcers bleeding and, and you know, I, it could cause me liver damage and I could die from taking this. And Think about it. Just one second. When we look at the Word of God, Here's what we should be all in agreement with. It is right. And if it is right, then this verse is true. If this verse is true, it should change your life. If it changes your life, you will seek the kingdom of God first. Amen? I'm going to read it one more time. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Folks, can I tell you, it doesn't really matter how much you can prophesy. That's not a guarantee that you're in. Can I tell you, based on this verse right here, it doesn't matter how many demons that you can cast out. It doesn't necessarily, by this scripture, mean that you're in. Folks, can I tell you that no matter the mighty works that you could do and stand before God and declare that I've done this work and I've done this work and all these mighty works, I've done youth ministry, I've done men's ministry, I've done children's ministry, I've preached sermons, I've led worship, I've done all this stuff for you, God. I prayed for people, God. Doesn't necessarily, by this verse right here, mean that you're in. This verse right here says that the people that will enter the kingdom of heaven is the ones who does the will of the Father. The will of the Father is in Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. I'm in this little Bible study that, that Billy Phillips is leading on Tuesday night. And for any of you men that's in here, I want to challenge you. There's not really a reason why every man in this building is not in that room back here on Tuesday night unless you have to work, physically have to work a job, and that's your shift that you work. But on Tuesday nights at 6.30, uh, about, I don't know, 10, 11 men are back there in that room, and we sure could use more. But Tony Evans um, is doing this, uh, basically, it's like his series uh, that, that we're going over, and we got a book that we read. And one of the stories that has just changed, I mean, it's kind of changed me, how I think. And he tells this little stupid little story that I know is going to ring true for you all today. He says, there's this chicken and this pig walking down the road. That's pretty funny, ain't it? Right? Chicken and a pig walking down the road. And they walk past this grocery store. And in the, in the grocery store window, there's a sign. And this sign, listen to this, this sign says... That, they're, that we are in desperate need of eggs and bacon. So the chicken turns to the pig, and the chicken says, I'll go in there and donate some eggs if you'll go in there and donate some bacon. And the pig turns over around to the chicken, and he says, hey, you're crazy, man. For you, it's just a contribution. For me, it's my life. Think about it. 
Many people are coming to church nowadays. Many people are attending Revive nowadays. Many people are attending the church down the street or the church down the street or the other church or the other 78 churches in this county. Many people are attending church giving a contribution because they sang some songs and they prayed for some people. But many people are not living the lifestyle that I gave my life to the gospel. I'm not just giving a contribution. I gave my life to Jesus Christ. 